today's event, Tax Strategy and Planning for Returning to the UK. Uh, my name is David Kelly, I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce. A very warm welcome to you, I hope you're all well and very much look forward to seeing you soon. So about the event, for those considering an eventual or imminent return to the UK, consideration of the tax implications compared to those of Singapore and the tax environment here is really important. After enjoying low income tax on earnings, no tax on investment income and no national insurance deductions, moving back to a high tax jurisdiction like the UK can often end up being a shock and a huge setback. Today, we will learn how, with a little care and planning, the UK can actually be surprisingly tax efficient. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speakers today, um, both Martin Rimmer, Head of Tax at Select Investors, and Nigel Preston, former CEO of St. James's Place in Singapore, who's dialing in from the UK today. As valued members of the British Chamber, Select Investors are also our event partners for this afternoon's session, so a huge thank you to them for your continued support of the Chamber. A couple of quick housekeeping uh, pieces. Please do post your questions into the Q&A session, um, into the Q&A box um, on your screen. There will be an opportunity for us to uh, filter some questions to both Martin and Nigel during this session. Um, you can also choose to ask these questions anon uh, anonymously. So just tick the anonymous box when you're, an when you're uh, putting those through um, if you don't want yourself to be known. Uh, before I hand over to Martin, um, I would like to run a quick poll. We find that these sort of online events are uh, just to sort of help with some interaction, some audience participation. We're going to run a quick poll. So I'm going to ask uh, Helen to pull up um, a quick poll. And the question is, when, you, when are you, if you are you, planning to move to the UK? So um, the question should be on the screen now. So if you can just put in your answers there. We'll give it five or six seconds. Great stuff. And the results there are on the screen. Okay, so 27% within the next 12 months, 35 majority in the, um, in the next three years, at some point in the next 10 years, not sure. Great stuff. That's so that we can get a bit of an understanding of, of the audience that we've got today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Martin to begin his presentation. Martin, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Really looking forward to this one. Thanks ever so much indeed, David. And let, my, uh, let me add my word of welcome to those you've already heard. And uh, Helen, if you could just reshare the screen, that would be marvellous. And I'll just seize control and we can get going. Uh, there we go. You can just pass that control over, Helen, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm delighted to, to be here today to talk to you about some of the key tax issues involved with moving back to the UK. It's something that we're talking uh, to our clients a lot about at the moment, and, and obviously it's important to get the, the planning for that right. Um, what I'll be talking to you today about is general tax planning techniques, and, and, and obviously the art of tax planning or any kind of wealth planning it is in being able to apply the law to a particular set of circumstances. So, so that's why we, we obviously always like to do our advice to clients on, a, uh, on an individual basis. So I would encourage you to get in touch. If there's anything you hear today that you want clarification on, we'll always be delighted to help. So what will we be covering today? Let's just move that slide on. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to be covering six key things i think probably in something of a relatively swift overview um i want to give you a little bit of a tour to tour de force of those six things there so key planning principles what are the main things we need to, to to be thinking about as we consider how to plan for move to the uk i'll i'll give you some thoughts about that and then we're going to tick off five key areas the uk tax treatment of earnings that you might receive after you've gone back that you weren't whilst you're out here um, I've got four lowest common denominator pieces of UK tax planning advice, which I think apply in the case of anyone who's going back to the UK. Um, so whether you're going back in the next 12 months, three years, 10 years, um, there'll be something there for you for sure. Um, one quick slide on what I call the dark art of split year treatments. In other words, when do you actually become resident? Um, because if we can identify the when, that then gives us our planning window in order to, to do the tax efficient planning that we then cover in the last two parts of the, the, the talk, which is about capital gains tax on property and, uh, and, and tax efficient planning with investments. 
Now, I wanted to start um, briefly by talking about why we do what we do. Uh, I'm a tax advisor. I've spent the last 23 years doing that. And, and, and I probably moved back to the UK, I don't know exactly how many times, but probably something like 800 to 1,000 times with clients. Um, and whilst 100% of my professional life is, is taken up with understanding the law and applying it, I'm very conscious of the fact that, that, that no one necessarily enjoys doing their tax planning. Why are we doing it? We, we're doing it in order to create financial security. Why are we doing that? We're doing that in order to create stability from which you can then go and have the kind of lives that you want to go and lead. So we're always thinking and planning with the end in mind. Um, so we, we're trying to get our clients to a place where they can enjoy the kind of financial security that they need to have the kinds of lives that they want to lead. So we do our tax and wealth planning with that very firmly in mind. So the first part of the talk today then is this. It's some tax planning principles. Let's just move the... Uh, slide on. So as David said in the, the opening um, part of the talk, we are, if you're moved to the UK, you are moving from a low tax jurisdiction where the highest rate of income tax is 22% to a high tax jurisdiction where the highest rate of income tax is 45%. And then if you add national insurance on, it's 47%. Where the UK does tax investment incomes, we have inheritance tax in force, we have tax withholding at source, um, a whole load of goodies that we need to plan for. Um, it's very important, therefore, to manage that transition in a very controlled manner. Now, uh, it, I, I'm very aware of the fact that some people don't have the luxury of time to plan. Some people are told, right, you're going back in very short order. But most of us, if we're fortunate, we do have the luxury of time and getting a proper sense on the key issues, ideally well into the tax year before you move back, I think is key. So there is a direct correlation between time spent in planning and, effect and effectiveness of tax outcomes. So it's all about spending that time pre-return to the UK. Yes, doing the things that need to be done beforehand, but getting all the structuring in place for your post-arrival future. Um, I'm going to be focusing in this talk primarily on the tax planning principles involved for people of British descent who are moving back to the UK. So when, when I move back to the UK, whenever that eventually is, from the day I become resident, I'll be taxed on global income and gains. But if you're not of British descent, you actually have better tax planning choices than I'm going to be outlining today. So there's a lot to talk about there. I'm not quite sure why the slides are slipping on as, as they're doing. Anyway, you do also have a great deal under your control as well. So, for example, you choose who owns what assets. You choose what assets to, um, um, that you own. You can actually choose how and when you become resident in the UK. You can also choose how and when you take advice. So, um, so take the time well ahead of time, please, and then we can make sure that we get the planning right. So what are the main tax rates in the UK? So let's just, just flash the table up there. Mm -hmm. For some reason, this is a little bit slow. Let's see if it works that way. Helen, are you able to um, just move that on for me? It's, there we go, it seems to have uh, just frozen briefly. <clears throat> So we have a basic rate of tax um, and, and the rate of tax really depends on the type of income that you have got. So for all incomes, it's not quite showing there yet, I'm sure it'll catch up in a moment. But for, for every type of income other than dividend income, the rates are 20% of the basic rate, 40% of the higher rate and 45% at the additional higher rate. For dividend income, it's only 7.5% of the basic rate. It's then 32.5% of the higher rate. Um, and then at the additional rate, 38.1%. Um, capital gains tax rates on residential property are 18% at the basic rate and then 28% at every other rate. And any other type of capital gains is 10% at the basic and 20% uh, and at the higher and additional higher rates. Now, what, what, why say that? Simply because there is a dynamic here in that if you are going to have income that's taxable in the UK, you want it, first of all, to be dividend income, and then uh, at the higher rates, you want it to be um, capital gains tax exposed. So it's 10% and then 20% 
Um, now I'm having some difficulties, Helen. I don't know whether you can take control back for me and try and fix this, but um, I'm, yeah, it's taking a little bit of time to, to flash everything up there. So, okay, great. So for £200,000 of pure salary, rental, pension and interest income, the rate of tax on that actually is £75,000. Um, I've given this presentation before, so I know the, uh, the number there. For dividends and shares from funds, if that's all you have with £200,000 worth of income, it's about £58,000, so the tax rate drops quite considerably. Then if it's just gains from residential property, you're looking at about £48,000 and £200,000 worth of gains. And then on gains from the sale of any other assets, it's roughly in the region of £35,000. So you can see that, that it makes a great deal of difference where you are deriving your income and gains from in the UK. Um, obviously, dividends and capital gains are, are going to be a very important source for you if we're looking for optimal tax efficiency let's see if we can move this on there we go there we go for some reason we're getting a little bit of a, a ding every time i try to, to try to do it so then i wanted to move on and talk about employment earnings so many of us when we return to the uk are, are going to continue to receive earnings that relate to uh, the work that we've done in Singapore, but perhaps we only then receive it later on. So the types of things that I've got in view here are, for example, deferred remuneration. So you're granted a bonus and it's only paid out in tranches over a period of years, or maybe you're given share options. Um, so you, you, you're granted shares, they have, a, have an option price that you can then invest and you can exercise after a certain period. But you might also be in receipt of a termination settlement. So really, the golden principle that I just wanted to illustrate to you here is that whilst there are nuances with termination settlements and stock options, for things that are typically classed as pure salary, so earnings, bonuses, deferred remuneration, paid as cash or shares, the UK will only ever seek to tax the part of those earnings that you receive after you've gone back to the UK that relate to the performance of duties as a UK resident. And God willing, if I can move this on, I'll be able to illustrate that with a, an example. Uh, there we go, that should move over now. There we go. So here we've got our, our UK tax years. Uh, and let's just say that we then have a uh, period when you become resident which isn't to come up, there we go. And then you've got your performance period uh, where you're actually earning that money. So in this case, it's a calendar year performance period. So as you can see, part of that um, is going to be taxable in the UK because you're a UK resident from that point at which you become resident. Um, and the pre previous part of that will be uh, not liable to UK tax because it was earned whilst you were non-resident. So hopefully Helen's just allowed me to take control of the screen again. Hopefully this uh, will work. There's a, oh, we're still not getting any joy with that, are we? Not to worry. Okay, there we go. So non-taxable and taxable. So even though it's paid after you become resident in the UK, the proportion relating to the, the, the earnings that you earn outside of the UK escape UK tax. Of course, it all needs to be popped onto a UK tax return, and, and obviously we can, we can help with that. There's another point I quickly wanted to make as well. Um, these are, of course, turbulent times and people are being laid off. If you are fortunate enough in that process to be offered a termination payment, so compensation for loss of office, there is a very strong tax reason to ensure that you're still non-resident for UK purposes when you receive that. Otherwise, if you are resident, the UK will simply tax all of it. So let's move on to the next part of the presentation. If the slides will allow me to do so, there we go. Lovely. So these are our four lowest common denominator pieces of tax planning advice. Number one, understand the UK tax treatment of your current assets. Um, the UK tax treatment is not necessarily linear. There are different classes of assets that are taxed in different ways. So things like property, shares, bank accounts, whether they're UK assets or non-UK assets, it doesn't really matter. They have a very clearly defined tax treatment. However, in the case of funds, 
so units that you hold in non-UK funds directly, there are actually two classes of funds. So one is called reporting status funds. So these are uh, is a class of non-UK funds where the UK government has applied uh, for what we call reporting status. So in other words, a fund manager has gone to the to HM Bevan customers and said, please treat me like a UK fund. When you sell units in a non-UK fund that has reporting status, um, whilst you're UK resident, then the gains are subject in total to capital gains tax. However, if the fund manager has not done that, so you hold units and funds which do not have reporting status, then the, um, then the gains are in fact subject to income tax, for which the highest rate is, as I've said, 45%. The third point I'd mention is that we just need to be a little bit careful with private banking portfolios. Um, private banking portfolios outside of the UK um, do not provide you with annual UK tax year reporting. So in the UK, if you have a portfolio with any, any manager of any sort, they are obliged by law to provide an annual statement of, um, of incomes and gains of all different sources, um, and that then allows you to pop that into your um, into your tax return. Whereas an offshore um, managed portfolio simply does not do that. No annual tax reporting, which makes the job of completing tax returns quite difficult. Now, many of you will have heard of companies like Royal Scandia, um, Aviva, Generali, Friends of Providence. Um, and many of you will have investments with those companies. So we also need to be quite um, careful with these because these two come in two different species. The first one is what we call a non-personalized um, life assurance wrapper. These just contain units and funds and cash and, and they have a very benign tax stream. We like them very much. But the other, the other variants might have shares in companies, uh, individual corporate bonds, and they have an absolutely horrendous tax treatment. So in advance of a move back to the UK, we need to be working with you to understand what you've got. Then finally, if you move back to the UK with CPF rights and you cash those rights as a UK resident, then the UK will not just subject all of it to income tax, you just pay income tax on the amount that your employer has contributed and the return on the on the CPF, you know, the, the return on investments um, from the 6th of April 2017. The second point I wanted to make is uh, provided you've been non-resident for capital gains tax for five tax years, then you are exempt from capital gains tax on anything other than UK land and property assets. So it therefore makes sense if you have gains in other assets to take them before you become a UK resident. That just means selling them. And then if you want to buy them back again, you can do that the next day. It also stands to reason that if you have items which are showing a loss, do nothing keep those losses if you're going to take them at all take them as a uk resident when those losses are useful to you and let's just be careful with exchange rates as well so best illustrated with an example so we have bill buying a um, quarter of a million dollars worth of sing singtel stock when the exchange rate was two to one so that's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars he sells them for three hundred and twenty five thousand when the exchange rate is 1.75 so he's got a paper gain of seventy five thousand dollars if we convert that into pounds sterling at those exchange rate, that $75,000 gain is actually an £85,000 gain. And even if Bill has made a loss of $25,000, he's still made a sterling gain that we want to take before you move back to the UK. So, um, so lowest common denominator pieces of planning right there. Let's now move on to this question of when you become resident for UK tax purposes. It's one of those things that, that I advise in every case to have done the planning for ahead of the tax year in which you move back. The law is very simple. The UK tax year runs from the 6th of April to the 5th of April. And if you trigger resident status in the UK by doing any one of these four things here, you become resident for that tax year. Um, and the law basically says that if that's the case, then you are liable to tax on global income and gains from the 6th of April, even if you trigger that, that event, say in the January or the February of the tax year. To compensate for that, the UK has legislated for five scenarios in which we can effectively split the tax year of return between a non-resident period 
and a resident period. Now, I won't take you through all of them um, because, because time just doesn't permit me to do that, but they carry conditions that you need to meet before you go back, in the tax year, in, in the, the resident part of the tax year, and then in some cases in the following tax year. They're not designed to catch you out. I can only think of a couple of cases in the last uh, seven years since this legislation has been here where someone who wanted to get split year treatment couldn't do it. But in essence, it typically boils down to you become resident from the date you begin to have a home in the UK or when you start to work in the UK. Um, now, it's one of those things uh, I could spend hours talking about this, but to be honest with you, the, the value comes in a personal conversation about that. But it's the one piece of a the one situation in which I would recommend in every case advice is taken prior to the tax year in which you move back. So on the home straight then, just a couple of things then to continue with. Um, first of all, I want to quickly talk about the tax implications of moving back to the UK with latent property gains. Property is probably the most um, uh, popular asset class amongst British expatriates. And the problem we have is simply this. Property is an illiquid asset class. It is difficult to sell. There is absolutely an advantage to selling um, UK property that has accumulated latent gains whilst you're still non-resident because the extent to which you're exposed to capital gains tax as a non-resident is very limited. However, it's difficult to do that. So, what I quickly wanted to do is um, just give you, just really just in this one slide, an illustration of three scenarios, quickly talk you through them and then talk to you about how we can defray the tax that is there. So the solutions to the problem that I'm about to, um, to, to, to set out are as follows. So number one, you can sell property whilst non-resident. If it's residential property in the UK, then you will only be subject to tax on the accumulation of gain since the 6th of April 2015. So if you've had property for donkey's years and it's got huge gains, if you sell it as a, as a non-resident, we're just interested in that, that little increment, and it is often only little, from the 6th of April 15. For commercial property, it's 6th of April 2019. You could also give the property away whilst you're non-resident. Giving is a capital gains tax event. And if you give it away to somebody else, next of kin, kids, whatever it might be, that is just effective as selling it. The only difference is you don't have the money. But as part of a longer term inheritance and succession planning strategy, there is a case to be made for that as well. Obviously, you only pay capital gains tax if you sell or give. You could simply choose to do neither. But if you do happen to incur a capital gains tax charge, there are things that can be done as a UK resident to actually defray that tax charge or reduce it by making qualifying investments into what's known as the Enterprise Initiative Scheme, the Venture Capital Trust Scheme, or the Seed Enterprise Initiative Scheme, or taking steps to increase that basic rate of tax, which you can do by giving charitably or making contributions. But the three scenarios are simply this. Former main home in the UK, which is rented and then reoccupied. So um, <clears throat> let's just uh, put this up here. So they buy their main home the £250,000 on the 1st of August 2008, they moved back to the UK um, <clears throat> in, in August um, 2021 and live in their property as a main home again. So they lived in it for an initial period of four years and then they go and reoccupy it for three and then they sell it for uh, 75000 They're resident when they sell, so the entire gain is liable and they have to pay their um, tax when they... Um, have to pay their tax when they um, within 30 days of completion. So scenario one, they live in the main home for four years, they go abroad um, for, for eight, and then they reoccupy for three years. So on the basis of proceeds of 675 and an original purchase price of 450, they've got a £425,000 gain, they've got relief for the fact they lived in it, but they still have a large amount of that gain that's taxable, and then Let's just assume the tax rate is at 28%. If it's a property that they bought, scenario two, um, after they've moved to Singapore, so they, they've also bought it in 2008, for example, they're in Singapore at that point, they go back in, uh, in, in 2021, live in it for three years, um, well, they haven't reoccupied it. So they, they have far less relief to play with. Um, 
for some reason that slipped on. The last scenario before we move on to the last part of the presentation was where they have their main home in Singapore. They've lived in it for many years. They then go back, rent it out for a period. There is still an accumulation of capital gains tax to pay then. So the message with that really is, is let's just focus upon um, identifying what those latent gains are, and then we can have a sensible decision about how to deal with them. So the last part of the talk is really then what to do tax efficiently with our investments and our cash. And I think the first thing I'd just like to say on that, if the screen will move on, is to use all of the allowances that we have. And I'm listing those allowances on the screen now. So the first £12,500 of income is tax-free so is the next £2,000 of dividends that you get. You can also enjoy £1,000 of, of yield from bonds and bank interest tax-free, and you can also have capital gains tax um, of £12,300 tax-free each year as well. Beyond that, um, you can invest up to £20,000 into an ISA each year, so that will provide you with tax-free income and gains. And if there are two of you, you can see that these really begin to add up. And if we do our planning absolutely perfectly, which is a bit of a contrivance, but if we could do that, it is possible to have £55,600 of income and gains delivered to you entirely free of tax before we even get into the basic rate. So the power of these allowances shouldn't be underestimated, and that's every year. So, so tax planning principle number one is let's make sure we use those allowance. Number two, let's generate dividend income. Dividends are the lowest taxable form of income at the basic rate. And then we want to, to take capital gains where we can, because again, capital gains tax is very low at the higher rate. We do want you to pay some tax. Well, you might, but I think it makes sense to pay some tax, but we don't want it to be higher rate tax. So we want to plan to generate incomes within the basic rate threshold, but to leave some room for expansion, for income growth, without throwing you straight into higher rates. Obviously, we need to think about who owns what um, so in order to optimize use of these allowances. For excess capital, uh, and particularly in cases where you would, you would have other incomes that would push you into higher rates, like, um, uh, like employment income or pension income, then we'd recommend passing excess funds into what's known as an international investment account. This simply prevents you being taxed at those higher rates year on year. And this is simply like one of the accounts owned by some, um, set up by some of the companies I mentioned before. The international investment account is the St. James's Place version of a non-personalized life assurance bond with a very benign tax treatment. Effectively a portfolio of unit fund investments. You are not taxed on the income and gains produced year on year and you can draw up to five percent of the amount invested per policy year and if you don't use your five percent in year one you can carry that forward to year two it's a very manipulable structure for inheritance tax planning purposes but it isn't tax free it does amount to a deferral of tax from a time when you would have been taxed at higher rates to a time where you will be taxed at lower rates and the deferral is until the earliest of one of these events here. Um, but of course, when the, if there is a tax charge arising on this, the law gives us certain specific reliefs that will really um, drive the tax liability down often to no more than the basic rate of tax. If you leave the UK again, that deferral becomes an exemption. You have a non-UK asset, you take gains from that, it is exempt from tax entirely. So let's take all that theory and then pop it into an example. So we have Matthew and Gemma moving back to the UK. So they do all the things we tell them to do, taking their gains, they've amassed some employment earnings, they've sold some property, they've got 2.5 million pounds to invest. They have some other income, so in this case, pension and rental income. So Matthew and Gemma each have pension income and they've got some jointly held investment properties. They already have their main home in the UK. So the question is then, um, how would we help them achieve their aims? And what they want is £100,000 of spendable income after fees and after tax. Uh, here at St James's Place, we always quote our investment returns after fees, so that, that's quite clear. And they don't want to take too much risk with their money. So how would we do this? Now, 
I've constructed this as a tax guy, so I'm not a financial advisor. So um, do take it with a slight pinch of salt in the sense that I'm not sure that some of the yields are right, but uh, I just want to illustrate the principle. So you have Matthew and Gemma, got their pension, got their rental income. They then have some money on deposit, which we would, of course, recommend. Um, 1% may or may not be achievable at the moment. Um, they can each have up to £1,000 of bank interest tax-free. So that 550 is actually going to be delivered free of tax. They invest £850 into a dividend-producing portfolio. £2,000 of dividends are tax-free for each of them. The balance is taxed at just 7.5%. So that's within their basic rate. Then they have some ISAs each doing 3% dividends, which they take, that's tax-free. And then the balance is invested into an international investment account from which they draw 5% of what they've invested each year. So you put those two things together and we have a gross, um, this gross income of 150,000 pounds, which is brilliant. The income tax on that is uh, really rather astonishing, including the pension income. It is a mere £4,000, so 2.7% of the total gross income produced, leaving them with £146,000. But of course, we do want them to do their ISAs each year, um, so let's strip that £40,000 out, and they're still left with more than their £100,000. But if that, for whatever reason, wasn't enough, let's just say their, 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 their equity portfolio is growing at 2.5% a year, well, they can take out 21 dollars thousand pounds and that's within the, the, the level of their capital gains tax allowances so a great deal of spendable income an effective rate of tax of just 2.1 percent now of course that is a contrived example um but it does show you the power with a little bit of flexibility who owns what what do you own how do you own it when do you do your planning uh, and how do you structure things that can generate some very attractive uh, net rates of tax in the uk there's so much more to say on this subject, obviously. Um, that's just uh, on, I think, my last slide. Um, an awful lot more that we could, could say about some sort of fairly niche areas of UK tax planning. But here at uh, Select Investors St James's Place, we're very proud of our repatriation service. We identify clients who are on a two to three year track to returning to the UK. Um, we run events especially for them, so they all get to know each other. Um, we design tax planning strategies, obviously the repatriation advice, we design wealth planning strategies, and the UK advisors that we work with come out to, um, to Singapore, and we all meet with our clients together, so there's a seamless strategy, and if you want to continue to deal with Singapore after you've gone back in terms of client relationships, you can do, albeit you must also have a UK regulated financial advisor so the point is it's a seamless strategy and we help with that um, I think um, as a business we tend to like to provide our tax advice as standard where clients invest with us and, and needless to say we're tremendously proud of the way in which we manage our clients money and St James's Place is the only company that I'm aware of that provides an indemnity a guarantee of the accuracy of the financial advice that we provide and that is an indemnity backed guarantee and of course we will actually do practicalities like tax returns so apologies for the fact that some of the slides took an age to, to move across we will be making the presentation available and, and i will be rerunning this at various forums but i think now's the time just to ask a second poll question um, i'd be grateful if you could um, get that going helen um, and the question is quite simply this if it can come up um, what are your main concerns about moving to the UK? So you can choose, you know, logistics and stress of the actual move, financial planning and high rates of tax, um, settling in, just getting back to life in the place that you haven't been for many years, and just the sheer um, fact that we've had a great life out here in Singapore and, uh, and we're concerned that we're going to be missing that. There's a clear trend emerging there, isn't there? Great. Excellent. It certainly tells you something, doesn't it? Excellent. So clearly, that's why you're here. Most people are worried about tax, uh, financial planning and high rates of tax. Let me say that, that we can and we will sit down um, with anyone who wants to talk to us about these issues. Uh, we're not necessarily for everyone. 
but we will be delighted to talk to anyone who wants to talk to us about these issues. So what I'd now like to do is, um, is introduce our, our special guest, um, Nigel Preston, who is joining us all the way from the UK. Um, I'll let Nigel introduce himself, but Nigel has the particular um, uh, benefit of having done this. He has gone back to the UK, having been um, uh, an expatriate before, he's been through the advice process, he's been through the settling back in, and um, I'm delighted to welcome Nigel to, 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 to join us now and to talk about some of the things that, that he has learned and that he would like to share with you um, from the other side. Nigel, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Um... Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm talking to you from a, a very autumn looking Surrey this morning. So uh, weather is just changing and uh, uh, you know, the summer has gone. But there you go. One of the things you will uh, experience on your return is suddenly you find that you've got seasons again. So uh, I suppose what I wanted to lead with today is that, uh, you know, in being kindly asked by uh, both David and Martin on behalf of Britcham Select Investors to have a quick 15 minute, I suppose, insight into life on the other side. I'm mindful that some of my content isn't much more than some of the very obvious things that you're going to possibly experience. So I try to break it down into sort of four areas. But initially, if I begin with, it might be worth just touching on sort of why exactly uh, I left Singapore. So some of you may or may not know, but I was uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer in James's Place, Singapore. In fact, I set up the office back in 2014 uh, when I left uh, the UK. I've been working with uh, the uh, St. James's Place business for some seven years then. And myself and my family had four wonderful years in Singapore, which, uh, you know, we really, really miss. I'll be honest to say that it's something that uh, I don't think my wife has got over the hangover of some of those champagne brunches. But that being said... Uh, uh, our decision uh, was forced upon us, one very much through uh, necessity and not choice, due to health reasons, I had to return to the UK. Uh, but, you know, in those four and a half years, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of experience that I had of not just working in Singapore, but also, you know, the whole experience of moving back and forth with some of the different moving feasts you experience, you know, uh, with regard to uh, what is quite a significant thing in life. So I arrived in 2014 and I departed 2018. So I don't really regard myself as a seasoned expat. Uh, but as I said, uh, we, uh, we for health reason had to return to the UK on quite a tight time frame. in sort of possibly it was no more than about four to five months uh, to get back. So uh, it was quite tight and there were some challenges and hopefully I'll give you an insight into my own personal learning and indeed some of those things uh, that, that happened along the way. So one of the first things I've touched on today is sort of the value of good preparation. Uh, and I know that is really a very obvious thing to say. And, and some of you obviously, you know, are, are significant, you know, uh, business players, as I say, uh, individuals that spend a lot of time in sort of planning processes. But, you know, I don't think you can over plan or underestimate. So what I'm not saying is that you need to have an element of trepidation in everything you do, but don't become complacent on this. So, one of the most important things from the soft facts, which Martin is very deliberate in his presentation about, is the timing. So think very carefully about when you return. Uh, we fortunately returned in that very hot summer in the UK. Uh, just after it, we had sort of four or five weeks of traveling around Australia. Uh, and we came back and it made a lot of difference that we weren't coming back to, you know, dark evenings and, you know, dark mornings. Uh, so remember, you're coming back to the Northern Hemisphere and that's the reality of life. Uh, the second thing on the planning process, which I think is really important, is uh, most of you, I'm sure, have partners, uh, and the process itself worked well for us uh, because I took the UK and my wife took Singapore. So we took the two planning parts uh, and individually worked them. We would get together every seven to 10 days when opportunity permitted and check that we were you know, joined up in our thinking but a husband, wife, one exit and one repatriation uh, process really worked for us. And it did iron out some of the uh, glitches that are along the way. Uh, there's lots of <clears throat> uh, planning uh, tools and lots of websites and there's even some good books. But there's nothing better than actually just two of you sitting down and making sure you're on the same page. Uh, one of the things I would say is try not to delegate 
your move back to the UK too much. You know, I know there can be a reliance on even helpers or indeed if you're fortunate enough to have relocation companies. But when things go wrong, because they do, uh, you know, you won't have them there. So you've got to be mindful that the minute you get back to the UK, it is a bit of reality, as it were. You are in a very self-sufficient move. Whilst there weren't any real disasters on our move, there were a few things that it was information that only my wife and myself uh, were you know, privy to. So value of good preparation, uh, really, really important. Uh, second part is, you know, if you look at sort of life now in the UK to take away some from the myths, you know, it, it's not that bad. Of course, there are things that you do miss out on. Uh, and I noticed on the poll there, there were a few people saying, you know, well, I'm going to be missing expat life. Of course, there are all certain things you'll never replace. You do pick up with friends, but you've probably heard this line before that you have moved on in a very sad way. So we had two very particularly close groups of friends, one we're still close with. The others have moved on or we've moved on. And obviously there is a different sort of esprit de corps that you generate whilst being an expat, even on our very short four and a half years. It means that you maybe have different horizons, interests and so on and so forth. But what you will miss is that esprit de corps, that sort of mutuality of, you know, let's go out and do this. And yeah, we'll, we'll try that, that you find in Singapore in various clubs and associations. So you've got to really keep uh, yourself busy. The busyness is very much dependent on you as an individual uh, or indeed your family circumstances. You might be going back to work, you know, so a lot of things will be very set up for you, how your life is going to run. You might be semi-retired or you might retire as I was planning to do uh, before uh, Martin and his partner Miles uh, convinced me to uh, stop following my football team around Europe and not going to the races that I'm now unable to do and obviously being dragged into the non-exec role, which I must say I really do enjoy working with Select. But there is, uh, you know, without a doubt, uh, a need for sort of uh, hobbies and interests because the UK does work at a far slower pace, if that's the way to do it, from your social perspective. So, uh, you know, just bear that in mind. You know, try to get engaged and you have to be, you know, I suppose ubiquity personified and have a crack at everything. Uh, wine is incredibly cheaper and it's not Sauvignon Blanc. I'd throw that one in. I thought that would help some of you. And it's nice to have the seasons. It's not always ridiculously humid. Uh, and whilst we do have, you know, some inclement weather, it's not quite like the Singaporean, uh, we say, uh, tsunamis that sometimes hit the shores. Um, significant number of our friends recently have been uh, leaving uh, the UK and actually uh, coming back, which is quite interesting. So of the sort of six or seven key groups of people we worked with, four or five of those have already come back. Uh, so what you do find is that a lot of returners previous, you know, or in the future will create, you know, their own sort of group as well. Uh, it's something we've looked at select, maybe having, you know, an expats club, a dining club, which is on the uh, horizon. And if we do do something like that, I'll obviously be in contact with David and Martin to let people know about it. But it's quite popular amongst the wives. And in their own way, uh, funny enough, the wives still are able to, you know, sniff out those rather spectacular dining deals and champagne experiences, even in London. Uh, so, you know, a lot of your friends, as I say, will already be back when you actually uh, realise this, or indeed there will be, some will be on their way back. <clears throat> one of the questions, excuse me, one of the questions I'm regularly asked is just about how much do you need <laughs> to live on? Well, that's, you know, down to your own personal circumstances and indeed, you know, what I would say, uh, your, your sort of occupation and indeed your lifestyle. Uh, there are things which are a little bit more expensive, okay? But in the majority, most things are cheaper. Uh, and I think you would know that anyway. But my only advice would be initially, uh, as you get back to the UK, uh, try not to make any significant purchases with capital, as it were. Uh, you know, get your financials right. You'd expect me to say that. Make sure you consult, obviously, with your professional advisors. But so for example, one of the tendencies that one or two of my friends have came back, the guys immediately went out and bought rather expensive cars, which I wasn't allowed to do. Uh, so I spent most of my time running around in a Fiat 500, which was, you know, a leveler, but at least I had a car, which I, I didn't have in Singapore. But why I say that is, you know, your, your attitude may be very different a year on about what is or isn't important to the family. I'm now running around in a rather nice Audi, uh, but it did take me some time to convince my wife to do that. But what I'm saying is we initially didn't make that purchase. We held back our capital. We looked at 
you know, the more important things along the way. So uh, uh, planning for the future is the big thing for me. Uh, because the minute you get back, suddenly this thing, and it's not to just embellish upon Martin, it is a reality, tax hits you in the teeth. You know, the UK system compared to the Singaporean system is just complicated. And being somebody that was the CEO of a wealth management company, I wouldn't say I was an expert, and please don't come to me for financial advice, uh, because I'm not qualified to the level of Martin or Miles or other people that you may have. But I have a very good practical sense and logic of what to do and um, how I should go about running my affairs. And the tax challenges of the UK are enormous, even for my simple sort of role of doing a little bit of, you know, uh, semi-retired work with the guys in terms of non-executive. The minute you start going back into the system, it just creates lots of challenges. So I would say uh, my number one thing now is watching how I generate an income you know, and how I take that income, okay, in retirement. Uh, it's really key. Uh, obviously, one of the great things about the UK, some of you may have may have missed, but it's worthwhile talking to the pension guys at Select, a young man called George, is the value of pensions freedom, which has sort of revolutionized, revolutionized uh, the UK pensions or retirement market would be a better way to put it. It's simplified things, and it means the way in which you take money and draw down, and indeed the way you can run your life and phase your own forecasting to income is just that much more flexible so really valuable but also worth spending time on i actually have one person that advises me on uh, my retirement solutions and i have a separate person that advises me uh, with obviously my investments both of course in james's place but i separate the two because the, the the two can be very very different in engenders some short and midterm and some very long term the minute that you start getting your head around, obviously, income and taking your pensions or whatever retirement in general, the next thing that really hits you very quickly is legacy planning in the UK. You know, as we used to say years ago, for those that are a bit greyer, this is all about sort of, you know, what I would call inheritance tax. Uh, it hasn't gone away. It's still here. And if you have assets like property and you're obviously keen to leave it to your next of kin, your family, you really need to very quickly once again, take advice on that. Once again, I can't possibly tell you the value of having good advisors, both on tax, financial planning and wealth management. It is really, really important, even as I say, uh, somebody like myself. But obviously, I would be saying that you, you'd expect me to say that. But I know that even on a day to day basis, you know, because it's a subject that I obviously know a little bit about. I'm always asking myself that second question. Have I really felt and braced that? So I'd like to end, if I may, because mine was meant to be just a very short, punchy uh, sort of insight to life, some of the practical tips and hints. And uh, these are things that in the bigger scheme of things that you may uh, forget or may not think about. But I'm just going to take some things that led to us along the way. Um, one thing that we forgot about was our credit rating. Not that we have a bad one, but we didn't have a footprint in the UK. So you have to have a credit rating in the UK. You would all know that but you need to start activating it before you come back. So taking a UK card or indeed starting to purchase or indeed create an audit trail of credit and financial engagement in the UK is really important because you haven't got one and it does make things complicated if you didn't. Fortunately, somebody had given me a nod on this before and it's one of the best bits of advice that we were given in our sort of repatriation. So make sure you start creating a credit uh, footprint. You can go to a number of agencies online like Experian and they will you know, share with you the rating and they'll give you ideas. But it's a really important thing. Uh, secondly, uh, don't rush into things like broadband, TV and all the different you know, channels, as it were, because, I mean, there's everything in the UK. You have Sky, you have Virgin, you have BT, you know, and then you have all the free views and Netflix and Apple TV. You're absolutely swamped. And I know if you've got a young family, the first thing is to sort of just go for Sky. Well, you've got to look at where your broadband is. It's not like Singapore. Not everything is fibre. There are certain areas where certain providers are stronger. So a little tip there, you know, do some research before just to check exactly who would be your best provider. And indeed, what you may or may not need. Once again, don't uh, jump into just what is the obvious, as it were. Uh, GP registering, a general practitioner medical side of things there's a lot of myths about this that you know for six months you don't exist on the register and you know the doctor won't see you. it's not quite like that but what i would say 
is as soon as you're thinking of going back or you go back before maybe in a preparation meeting, I would get to see the doctor and tell them about re-registering. So you can immediately fall back into the national health system. Maybe look at your existing medical assurance if you have it as part of your package and see if the existing provider will transfer it to the UK. I, would know, I know that's easier said than done, but once again, the guys at Select can help you with that. Uh, utility bills, uh, they have a lot of these competitive websites where you can sort of switch and move from one to another. And there are some very you know, specific, to, we live in an eco-friendly house where we even re-harvest the water, uh, you know, and we have solar panels and so on and so forth. So we chose a particular you know, uh, provider for a number of reasons. But there are lots of different providers. It's a very competitive market. It isn't sort of maybe as controlled as it might be in Singapore. So shop around, but do make sure that initially, if you're going back to your own home or you're renting, you've got uh, access to that provider via a website and not telephone because of the phone distance and the cost of calls. So make sure they're user friendly as a website. Uh, I can't possibly uh, under a sort of state the value of getting uh, Martin to introduce you to a UK accountant. It's any form of income. It's so much more complicated here, believe me. My own situation wasn't as bad as a friend of mine who was the chief financial officer of a uh, sort of, uh, it was a container a business in Singapore. Uh, he flew back to Singapore from Geneva on business and he got arrested uh, because, and he was a chief financial officer and he had a particular well-known company helping him because there was an outstanding uh, bill, tax bill, uh, and uh, he had to do a night uh, in the cells in Singapore. So uh, believe me, get all you know, your sort of uh, loose ends nicely tied up with the accountant. And if you have anything that is a record of conclusion the first couple of times back and forward into Singapore, always keep it with you when flying, just in case something goes wrong. These, these aren't myths, these stories. They do happen. It's not a criticism of Singapore, but they absolutely finite on this. And I have been my stopped, myself stopped and asked a number of particular questions. And the question was, within an hour in a room, somebody told me I had $137 that I didn't know I had, which I hadn't had refunded as a tax bill. But I was alerted into the system. That's how it works, as it were. So, uh, you know, worthwhile not sort of just taking the tax situation for granted, conclude on it. When you get back to the UK, also revisit your wills immediately. Uh, you know, things have changed, your circumstances change. There's some really good tax and trust work that can be done or tax and trust work that goes hand in hand. So we've now got some tidy trusts in place that also further alleviate that potential legacy bill. Uh, have an Air Mars audit. Bear in mind, you might not be as privileged enough to fly with Chris Flyer and Singapore Airlines or Emirates anymore. So for all intents and purposes, look at maybe one of those airlines where they cover six or seven and transfer their miles. Because, uh, you know, as I say, you might not have the benefit of business class in the future. Uh, and I say the big thing really is just uh, try not to make any significant capital purchases initially unless you have to. Keep your capital with you. Uh, and you know, make decisions. Things won't go away. Uh, they'll always be there as a choice. So uh, hopefully that gives you a sort of a, a, a whistle-stop summary of what life is back in the UK. Uh, David has had to go through these sort of dreadful presentations of mine previously. David, I'm going to hand back to you. So uh, hope that sort of uh, achieves a few objectives for you guys. Nigel, a huge thank you and to Martin for your updates presentations. Really, really good. And conscious that we are running out of time, so happy just to be a little bit flexible given the importance and urgency of this topic. So, uh, Martin, if I could just ask you to uh, join us for a quick Q&A because we have got some questions that have come through and we've were sent some as well before this presentation. So, um, let's start with, uh, with, with Martin Scott's question to uh, Martin, if that's okay. He says, are there any surprise costs, taxes, um, other than settling one's deferred income tax bill that Singapore could impose as part of a Brit repatriating to the UK? Okay, good. Uh, hi, Martin. Good to see you. Um, good question. Obviously, it's about Singapore tax rather than UK tax. So, so I profess a, a level, of, level of ignorance there. But, but my experience teaches me that I believe Singapore has the right um, 
to to bring forward an assessment tax on on the grant to share options that have not already been subject to Singapore tax and may not have vested by the time you leave. I believe that they may crystallise and that might lead, land you with a tax bill when you haven't actually got the assets. I may be wrong about that, but that, that's my understanding. When you become non-resident for Singaporean tax purposes and continue to have a rental property in Singapore, you are taxed at a flat rate of 22%. Okay, um, that, that's not as bad as the UK. But there's nothing I know of that, that IRAS can impose on a discretionary basis. They work to the rule of law here, as we all know. The tax law is what it is. Um, they don't have the right to say, right, I'm just going to tax you a little bit more because I don't like this or I don't like that. Um, needless to say, as part of any repatriation strategy, there's also an exit strategy from Singapore. And, you know, we can connect you with some very, very good uh, and well, you know, and, and well priced Singapore tax advisors if you need that. Super, thanks, Martin. Um, Angelo um, has asked about split year treatment. Um, a person returning to Singapore on the 1st of October, hence 186 days into the UK at the end of the FY, starts UK employment on the 16th of October after being away from the UK for more than five years. Can the person claim split year treatment and from what dates? Excellent. Um, hi, hi, Angelo. Good to, good to, good to chat with you. Um, well, I can tell you that your split year treatment date will not be the 1st of October. It's not going to be the date when you physically arrive in the UK. It will be either the date when you first enter a property and make that property your home, whether that's a rented property or a property you own, or it will be the first day on which you do at least three hours of work in the UK, subject to you then subsequently for the next 365 days meeting certain conditions about the performance of those duties. Um, it also requires conditions to be met in the period from the 6th of April until that date in say October, <clears throat> um, in terms of your physical presence in the UK. So it's one of those things where the law is needlessly complex but when you apply it, it makes sense and it isn't too difficult to meet those conditions. So you'd probably, I expect you to get split year treatment and the fact that you will subsequently spend 186 midnights in the UK makes no difference to that answer at all. Um, it's just a question of when exactly, enter a house or start the job. So we, we'd, need to, we'd need to talk that one through as I, as I believe we've got some time scheduled to do. Stuff. We've, we had a couple of questions beforehand. Um, there was one about redundancy payments. Um, so redundancy payments in, is, is tax free in Singapore, uh, but paid out after I arrived back in the UK. Um, will it then be taxed by HMRC, even though it was paid in Singapore? Yeah, I, actually, I'm really grateful for that question because you know, I, I gave myself half an hour to do this talk. And of course, you know, redundancy payments are massively important. The short answer to that question is, if it is what we call a qualifying redundancy payment, and I guess it would be, it's compensation for loss of office, um, perhaps there's no uh, expectation that you're going to get one per your contract, then if you're resident when you receive it, every penny of it is subject to UK income tax. The first 30,000 is tax free. Everything else is subject to tax you will be massively advantaged if you can ensure that you are still non-resident for UK tax purposes when you get that money. We can help you achieve that. Obviously, you then need to meet conditions. Um, but what you will find is if you can, if you can stay non-resident, the UK government, in the very worst cases, only interested in the part of that settlement that corresponds on a pro rata basis to your service as a UK resident. And that might be nil. Um, so it's important to, it's one of those situations where it's super important to be managing the point at which you, you become a UK resident. So I'm very glad you asked the question because it's going to be relevant to a number of listeners. Yeah, and, and we've got another one here around, um, it's, it's also sort of around split payments, but around an expat family. Mm. If um, kids and a spouse uh, relocate mid-year um, and the husband carries on working until the end of the year in Singapore, is there a way to avoid being taxed in the UK on worldwide income until that time? Is that achievable and how? Yeah, um, another excellent question. <clears throat> the answer is actually quite complicated. It can go one of two ways. Either um, you do what is necessary to ensure that your family are tax resident from the 6th of April uh, in the tax year. In other words, they, 
they must not meet the conditions to get split year treatment. Split year treatment is a part of the law. If they meet the conditions, they get it. So we need to manage that they do not meet those conditions and therefore don't get it, which therefore leaves you open to claim split year treatment uh, from that later date in the year. So it is possible. The other way of doing it is to say, right, my family will get split year treatment, but I will do what I need to do to remain non-resident for the whole of the rest of the tax year. Now, the reason that's the case is because when you send your family back to the UK, they've got to live somewhere and that place becomes a home to you. And, uh, and if you become residents in the UK, if you test positive for UK resident status in that tax year, albeit six months later in your family, you acquired a home in the UK at the same time they did, and that would be your date too. So we need to manage it in one of those two ways. Can, it can be done, um, and obviously we can guide you on that precisely. Thanks, Martin. If I can sort of bring uh, Nigel back in as well, I guess um, if, I did have to sort of really push you both for um, the single most important piece of tax planning advice concerning move to the UK. What what would it be? What what, what would it? What would that one single most important piece? Um, what do you think that is? Nigel, do you want to go first on that one? From your yeah, I, I think uh, I re I've described this before when talking uh, in Singapore uh, when we've had our sort of soiree get-togethers, Martin and I, with existing clients. I would describe that, David, as building the runway because you can't have these two things in isolation, you know, so you, it just doesn't stop the minute that you leave Singapore and that's concluded. The tax focus continues. The financial services, wealth management, financial planning piece goes alongside that. So the value of having a repatriation experience available to you so there's somebody to sort of pass you over you know, and you don't have to go through that whole conversation of explaining to another financial advisor and tax consultant, whatever it is. And, you know, so though some of us do love the sounds of our own voices, uh, believe me, it's a painful experience having to just explain something all over again. So that synergy of having a handover like a baton in the relay uh, is really valuable. I would say that you know, I can't possibly sort of overstate how important that is. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, from my point of view, I'm going to be really boring, actually. Just, you know, I work for a wealth planning company and I want all my clients to invest loads of money with us. But I've got to say that for me, the single most important thing, if you stuck a gun to my head, what must an expat get right? It's split year treatment. Um, you need the advice on that in the tax year before you move, in most cases. It's, it's getting that right creates the foundation upon which every other bit of tax planning is built. So let's get the building blocks right. Yeah, so split year treatment, complicated and boring, but, but very important. Thank you. Thank you very much to you both. Look, um, there are no sort of no more questions that have come through from the live audience here, um, which um, leads me to say a huge thank you to Nigel and Martin for your time today. Really, really interesting. Um, I know there's quite a lot to digest as well. So this presentation as a, as a member benefit will be available for our for our members as well. Um, so please, if you if you do need to rewatch it, please do. Um, and a huge thank you to Select Investors too for supporting today's event. Um, these are absolutely the sort of events that we want to put on for our members as well. And it was great to have some questions that were coming through before the presentation and during. So thank you very much for all for your interactivity today. And just to very quickly wrap up, um, uh, we have um, some fantastic events coming up um, within the chamber. Um, we've got a celebrating diversity photo competition on the 7th of September. Please do have a look at that. We've we've had to put that into a digital sphere, but there's some absolutely wonderful presentations there, and, and I would really um, suggest you have a look at it. Um, we've also got a business opportunities in China and Singapore presentation with our Britcham colleagues up in uh, Shanghai. So that's looking like a really good event. And our International Women's Day virtual conference as well, which is split over three sessions, really, really engaging. Um, and we're, we're very pleased to have um, uh, former uh, Commissioner of the uh, London Fire Brigade, Danny Cotton, joining us as a keynote speaker. Really, really interesting lady as well. So it's set to be a really good event. And of course, leading up to our annual business awards, we've had some fantastic entries this year. So please do get involved with us so we can celebrate the best of business through the Chamber as well. 
That leads me to say um, we will be just sending through a feedback form to you. Please do fill that out. Um, it's always good for us to know um, how we can improve our events um, and great to get your feedback. And a thank you to you. Um, thank you all very much. Um, we hope you can join us again. And of course, if there's anything that the Chamber can do to support you or your business, please do reach out to me or the team. Um, our email addresses are all on the website if you're not connected to us or find us on LinkedIn. We'd be very, very happy to see where we can support you. So with that, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again to our speakers. Thanks so much to Select Investors again.